First lesson today comes from the Old Testament prophet Daniel, beginning at chapter 12, starting at verse 1. The time of the end. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Here ends our Old Testament reading. Our epistle lesson today comes from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, beginning at chapter 1 and starting at verse 5. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angel, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here ends our second reading. Our gospel lesson signed for today comes from the 13th chapter of Luke, beginning at verse 22. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you began to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Open to us, then he will answer you. I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, well, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west, from north and south, and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Here ends our scripture reading. Let us pray before the preaching of God's word this hour. Heavenly Father, as we think on these words that we heard in the scriptures today, that they are kind of tough words to hear. 
how we recoil a little bit and remembering that the way is straight and the door is narrow. So help us, Lord, to remember that, that you have still provided a way for us to have full fellowship with you and eternal life and to have peace in our hearts right now. So bless us, Lord, as we examine your word and what it has to communicate to us today. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our title of this morning's message is called Eternal Loss. Our reading today from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 contains a few verses that stand out to the reader, particularly verse 8. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Now, as you heard, this message of the way of salvation is not specifically restricted to 2 Thessalonians. We heard the same message in our gospel reading today from Luke 13 of the narrow way. The book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 8, talks about the lake that burns of fire and brimstone. Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, John the Baptist said that his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now you might be tempted to think of these verses, that these verses that talk about eternal loss are restricted to the end of the Bible. Maybe Paul's epistles, you can find some of those in Revelation. But you hear that that is not the case that these words come from the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We think of Matthew chapter 5, verse 29. For it's better to lose your right eye than to have your whole body thrown into hell. Matthew chapter 13. The Son of Man will send his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and evildoers. Luke chapter 12, verse 5. I tell you, friends, do not fear those who kill the body. And after that have no more that they can do. But I warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he is killed has power to cast into hell. We tend to forget that Jesus is the one who tells us more than anywhere else in the scriptures not only about the kingdom of heaven but also the kingdom of darkness. We tend to think, oh, that's Old Testament talk. Jesus is the new covenant. He comes to speak about love and mercy. The Old Testament is about wrath and judgment. It couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, the word hell is not found anywhere in the Old Testament. Certainly the concept is there, like we heard today in our reading from Daniel chapter 12. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. But the concept is certainly there. The Old Testament speaks with frequency about the day of the Lord, about the judgment, about the great reckoning. And God's justice will finally be executed. Yes, it is uncomfortable to speak on the topic of eternal separation. Part of the reason that we have a difficult time thinking about hell is because it feels so foreign to our discourse for today. Many churches would hardly recognize the word. And even if you have heard a sermon on hell and eternal loss, we tend to put distance between ourselves and the term. We tend to think of hell as a place for quote-unquote bad people. People not like you and me. People like Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler. People like child abusers and rapists. But the scriptures plainly speak that we all deserve God's temporal and eternal punishment apart from Christ's righteousness. As Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what then does it mean when the scriptures talk about eternal loss? 
Well, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 17 says that it is a place without light. It is the blackest darkness. Matthew chapter 8, verse 12 talks about it being eternal punishment. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10 describes it as torment. So people have wondered, as they read these verses, how can this be? How can this be that God, whom we worship as the one who loves each one of us, who loves our souls, the merciful one, how can it be that God would even have anything to do with a hell? Isn't God too benevolent for such a thing? How can a merciful God send people to hell? Now we tend to think of a person's eternal sentence being something that God does to the person. But really, is it the judge or is it the criminal who is to blame for the punishment? The judge is simply carrying out a role. You know, as we think about in our civil jurisprudence, do we blame the criminal for the sentence or do we blame the magistrate? We understand that the judge is simply carrying out, facilitating a process. Yes, God does send somebody there, you could say, but at the same time, he is simply giving you what your soul has always desired. Because through his son, Jesus Christ, he has sent the message of the gospel to the world. That it has been clearly communicated to us and our part of the world at least that there is a way to eternal life and there is a way to eternal destruction. And the one who opens the way to eternal life is Jesus Christ himself. That way, as we hear, is narrow. But the way unto destruction is broad and wide. Yet so many people, for whatever reason, we could come up with answers all day, want to take the broad path unto destruction. Even though Jesus Christ has clearly laid out the way to eternal life, so many would walk off that road unto destruction. How sad that it is that our Lord has offered the way so freely. It would be one thing if we had to earn our way, if we had to accumulate enough righteousness and accomplish enough good works and finally hope to make our way all the way to the top to heaven. But that's not the way that it is, as you know, that our Lord sent his son Jesus Christ to come and pay the full penalty and make full satisfaction for your sins so that you need not fear the grave, so that you know what your eternal destiny can be. And so, yes, it is indeed uncomfortable to think about things like eternal perdition. But we have the ultimate antidote. We have the one who has opened the way for us. And this isn't simply just some type of general proclamation that preachers make. It's not some type of offer that's just thrown out there that this message is for you and for your soul, that Jesus Christ died for you. That's why we use that kind of terminology in the faith, that we talk about things personally applying to you. He died for your soul. In the same way, when you who are believers will come forward to this altar later this morning, that'll be the body of Christ given for you. It's not something that you need to accomplish. It's not something that's just broadly thrown out there. But that Jesus Christ has opened the way of eternal life for you. And how wonderful it is that he has done such a thing. Because if he did not die for you, then you would have to suffer these spiritual consequences. It would be a scary thing to wonder. Am I going to make it? Am I not going to make it? Was I good enough? Did I accomplish enough? Was I spiritual enough? Was my prayer genuine enough? Was I sincere enough when I did things for other people? Did I do something to help somebody? Or did I assist that person because somebody was watching and I had to be a quote-unquote good Samaritan in that moment? But that's not how it works in God's kingdom and in God's economy. He has simply opened the way unto eternal life. And whosoever will may come. 
Simply believe, trust in his words. This is the way that he communicates these precious promises. Our Lord does this. He communicates to you because he loves you, because he cares about your soul, because he wants what's best for you. He wants you to serve him here by serving others, and he wants to have you in his home for eternity. And he has made a clear pathway for you to get there by simply trusting that he has opened the way on your behalf for your sake. So trust him for peace in your heart today. Trust him for that time when you receive that diagnosis that your life is going to come to an end soon. Trust him for that moment when you're going to place that loved one in the grave. And trust him for eternity, that he will come back to bring you where he is. What a great promise that we have amidst all these words that we hear in the scriptures that warn us, that seek to awake us, that seek to bring us to mind what kind of sinful creatures we each are. Those are indeed important warnings for each one of our souls. But our Father, through the mercy of his Son, has opened the way clearly for you to have peace in your heart for this life and for the life of the world to come. Let's pray about that today. Heavenly Father, we read these words of destruction, of torment, of utter darkness, of suffering, and Lord, it makes us squirm every time that we have to come these words in the Bible. Father, but you give us to them so that we would be awakened out of our spiritual slumber. So Lord, as we remember in your word how it clearly communicates to us that it's easy to go unto hell, but the way to heaven is difficult. And it's only been opened by your son, Jesus Christ. And so we thank you that amidst all these words that could bring us down and depress us and, and bring us great consternation, that there is the clear call of the gospel of salvation full and free. How we thank you, Lord, that it has been communicated to us in such a way that we could not even begin to frustrate it. It's so clever. And Lord, we would try to frustrate it by adding our works, adding our efforts. But Lord, as we go back to your word again, we read that, that it is only in your son, Jesus Christ, that nothing in our hands we bring, Heavenly Father. So Lord, as we think on these strong words today and kind of don't know exactly what to do with them, we pray that when people come to us that we would share these words, that when people are looking for answers that we would provide something Lord, amidst all the chaos and, and noise of this world, a world that hardly can even believe that such a reality exists, your word clearly points to us that there is a right way and a wrong way. So teach us, Heavenly Father, to walk on the narrow path, that you would sustain us for this life, that you would give us assurance to face eternity. We thank you, Lord, for your great mercy and pardon through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.